Associated Writing Programs Award, Angel Interrupted, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, and his most recent, Wrong. Shepard's youth was spent in the Bronx, except for his high school years, when he lived in Macon, Georgia. He holds degrees from Bennington College, Brown University, and the University of Iowa. The recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including a Discovery of the Nation Award, the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Scholarship, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, Shepard's work has appeared in Best American Poetry annual anthologies, as well as such prestigious journals as American Poetry Review, the Kenyon Review, Poetry, and the Paris Review. An assistant professor of English, he is currently on sabbatical from Cornell University. Reginald Shepard's poetry is at once lyrical and classical. Classical, often in its subject matter, in its frequent evocation of Greco-Roman myth, lyrical in its radiant language. In one poem, Shepard writes, lyric means loss, and the lyricism in his work comes not from covering up or embellishing a flawed reality, but from paring down, chiseling away layers of misinterpretation to arrive at the complicated beauty of the real. The speaker of these poems, as a gay black man, has suffered from such misinterpretations, from perceptions, miseries. But the poet also realizes that the exclusionary nature of perception has failed all of us again and again. Thus, his distrust of representation, of that impulse to portray human experience in the most simplistic way, in the easiest rather than the truest language. Refusing to see the self as a momentary flaw, the speaker in one poem says, I'd like an acid rain to steep my skin and peel the interpretations off. But once again, the real isn't that simple because misinterpretations come from inside as well. His poems also explore the failure to understand and accept oneself, as is suggested in one of his many poems alluding to the myth of Narcissus. It was a lie they told about Narcissus, a libel on his name. He never loved himself, not anyone who looked like him. Narcissus didn't know his own profile. In the retelling of this myth, this loss of self, not self-love, is what destroyed Narcissus, for you've got to lose yourself to be found wanting. The title of his last book, Wrong, refers then not to the self, but to those who believe in the myth of identity, that a label can capture and dismiss a human being. What is seized, what is broken into pieces, that I keep, the poet writes. I never asked for anything, so you said, give that up. Yes, this is a difficult music, but that is the nature and ultimately the beauty of truth. Please welcome Reginald Shepherd. Survive, and he woke up happy, and I 
But yeah, this one was speaking directly to me, and then later I found out it was part of an installation piece by um, <coughs> the installation artist Jenny Holzer. And I was really disappointed about you know, this sort of vision I had of the world giving me an answer. Um, wasn't that at all. Um, the difficult music. I started to write a song about you. Then I decided, no, I've been trying to write about violence for so long. You are my mother. I love you more dead. Not a day goes by when I'm not turning someone into you. A week of traffic jams and fog filtered through glass, the country crumbling in my sleep. Old men in plaid jackets on the corner drinking quart bottles of old Milwaukee. The color black again and again. My first summer in Boston, a bum glanced up from tapping at the pavement with a hammer to whisper nigger, laughing, when I walked by. I passed the age of consent, I suppose. My body was never clean again. In Buffalo, a billboard said, in a dream you saw a way to survive and you woke up happy. Justice talking to the sidewalk on Main Street. I thought it was talking to me, but it was just art. I've longed too many mornings hallucinating your voice, too drunk with sleep to understand the words. Some afternoons, I can see through a history of heart attacks in two tenement apartments, writing your silted name on snow with which the lake effect shrouds a half-abandoned Rust Belt city. I've compared you to the snow's unlikely predicates, the moon's faceless occupation. Some drift always takes your place. I was just scribbling again. Take it from me, my stereo claims. Someday we'll all be free. If anyone should ever write that song, the finely sifted light falls down. Um, a lot of the poems in this first book, and actually even more in my second book, Angel Interrupted, have to do with exploring <clears throat> the intersections of, sort of my personal history and the sort of history of black people in America, the, the slave trade and its legacy, and so figuring out both the connections and the disconnections, and I'm sort of trying to figure out sort of where I as an individual stop and I as a historical product um, <clears throat> begin and vice versa. And this is a poem that, this next poem I'm going to read, this poem that engages in some of that exploration, some of those juxtapositions. It's entitled, Slaves. These are the years of the empty hands. And what were those just past? Swift with the flash of alloy hulls, but carrying no cargo? Outside our lives, my mythical America. Dingy rollers fringed with soot deposit cracked syringes and use condoms on beaches tinted gray by previous waves. But when an hour wakes just for a moment, everything begins again. All of it is yours, the longed for mundane, men falling from a cloud filled sky like flakes of snow onto the ocean your mother immersed in ordinary misery and burning breakfast, still alive in the small tenement kitchen. You understand I use the second person only as a marker. Beyond these sheltered bays are monsters and tarnished treasures of lost galleons, it's death to bring to light. The ships put out and they sink. Before the final mast descends, the shadow of a single sailor is burned across the sun, then wrapped in strands of cirrus. 
his European skin a gift to the black and unknown ocean floor. Of the slaves thrown overboard to save the ship, no words remain. What memorial the public beach becomes in late October, scattered with Puerto Rican families on muddied sand, still lighter than a black man's pound of flesh? It abrades my skin. I can't touch that perfected picture of myself. No white wave will wash either hand clean. There's a wind riding in on the tainted waves, and what it cannot make whole, it destroys. You would say that all along I chose wrong. Antonyms of my own face lined up like buoys. But there is another shore on the far side of that wind. Everything is there, outside my unhealed history, outside my fears. I can see it now, and every third or fourth wave is clear. <coughs> this poem is entitled Wide Sargasso Sea, um, <coughs> it's entitled after the novel by Jean Meese, which envisions <coughs> the earlier life of Mrs. Rochester in Jane Eyre, yes, I know, I can't do the name of that novel, <clears throat> as um, the heiress of a sort of decaying Caribbean plantation and sort of, and sort of um, revisiting sort of that, um, the remains of that sort of colonial economy you know, based on slavery. Why does Agasso see? The bodies of the black men smolder and then are still. Tendrils of Jamestown nicotine redeem the bird to burn again, cured on white sheets. There's a stain indelible as indigo. Or tired of all that, watch instead his lashes sweep downwards on their arc, which gives neither breeze nor shade. Pendant palm fronds sweep the glittering sands of yet another El Dorado, the island paradise of smallpox and sugar cane, <coughs> and blue-eyed planter sons at play. But better to make bitter the kiss, char the face into the stuccoed wall, than taste the honeyed ash of foreign lips, the cool and soothing poisoned rum. The fatal aloe heals all wounds. If such are the broken skin, I'll be the scar, the boiling tar beneath the cobblestones of Spanish town. And parched the bedrooms, the corpus only of what the light had eaten away. Torn photographs bear the print of bloodied lips into sepia and anato, marooned refusals on black and burning archipelagos. Shall I address such heroes of the here and now as have survived my memory? Or let them lie where they have fallen? Many of my poems <clears throat> invoke, address, argue with, or simply enthralled behind a figure sort of, of the demon lover, so sort of doppelganger, <clears throat> who's both a kind of mirror image of myself, kind of ideal image of myself, and a sort of you know, desired image, sort of, <clears throat> um, a sort of imaginary beloved. And this poem is one of those. Um, it's entitled The Friend, and I actually had this dream. The Friend. <clears throat> This recurring dream after the lethargy of listless reading, restless wanderings through books that always seem posthumous. Words another might have read fall from the hand like tattered leaves the trees cast off, picked up and scattered on a casual walk. Blank pages shredded as snow that mounts against the window he wraps on. 
How does he know my name when I am so often another in the dream? This body isn't mine, but takes me traveling when it moves. There, I am only the ghost who starts the play, attendant on my spectacle. He wants to be like that, the absent, omnipresent one. He wants to be the blood-red moon and not the startled children pointing. Nothing startles him. He wants it to inherit me. In the dream, I am always posthumous, the sole survivor of myself in the rubble of my city soaked in soldiers and fine-grained mist. That's my brother, he lies, and leaves me with a photograph of snow, as if it were a photograph of me. What is anywhere in the dream? So that's where I wait, and of course he is there, invisible as always, a doorway as always, with the fear that nothing comes to an end. He wants to do everything just once, he sleeps eyes open. So I won't miss it when it comes back. So it won't be the same. He plays a game with clouds and calls it swimming, washes ashore as the world. Made of the singular, made of the blanks. The one standing at the half open door with a familiar shape, the one in bed who can't move, who is it, I ask, but he won't tell me his name. <clears throat> this poem is entitled Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair, which is the title of, actually a scene of folk song, which is it was written by some fellow in the 20s, I think. I had a, a project, I have lots of projects, but a few which I actually followed through on, of a series of poems called Standards. That was one of the, each was going to have the title of some you know, old song and incorporate lyrics from the song into the poem. And I only wrote about three or four of them, and then my attention wandered. You know, something, something else came on television or something. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> this was one that I did manage to complete in that series. Black is the color of my true love's hair. In the painting by Guido Reni of Saint Sebastian in the Palazzo Rosso, which reproduction makes available to those who travel only on the page, the saint to be, he's not yet assumed by artifice, encumbered with perfections, endures continual martyrdom with a visual sigh gazing almost directly upward, as if to ask, what now, my love? Or hum a chorus of, is that all there is? The body always some song or another. The eye trapping the simulacrum of a surface hands have touched can't help but note how lush the uncorrupted flesh appears. The curve, for one example, of the waist, narrower circuit of the boy, just beneath the instance of an arrow's entrance, or the shadow just above the tangled one part that is surely pubic hair. One grasps that sainthood is an attribute of youth, the wondrous fair, as in old ballads. They always end. The boy in the Eagle Discount supermarket for another, an apparition in a backwards baseball cap appraising cups of meat in artificial light, deciding what he can afford to buy, how much each cut costs. I love the ground on where he stands. His face, unverifiable. This poem is entitled, Amuse, and it has no accompanying story. Amuse. He winds through the party like wind, one of the just who live alone in black and white, bewildered by the eating of his body. 
you. You talk like winter rain. He's the meaning of almost morning, walking home at 5 a.m. The difference a night makes turning over into day. Simple birds taking claims on no sleep. Whatever they call those particular birds. He's the age of sensibility at 17. He isn't worth the time of an afternoon it takes to write this down. He's the friend that lightning makes, waking the naked tree. Thunder that waits for weeks to arrive. He's the certainty of torrents in September. Harvest time and power lines down for miles. He doesn't even know his name. In his body, he's one with air. White as a sky winched with rain. It's colder. It's hard to breathe. I'm drowning is somewhere to be after a month of drought. The last one I'm going to read from this volume is um, tant entitled Tantalus in May. Uh, I'm sure we all know the story of Tantalus, who's condemned by the Greek gods <coughs> to sort of stand waist high in a pool of water with a bunch of grapes <coughs> just within reach of always receded as he reached for them, and with the water receding as he bent down to drink it <coughs> and speak of his poem again. Similarly feels the world be sort of always out of his reach and was answered for that. Tantalus in May. When I look down, I see the season's blinding flowers, the usual mesmerizing and repellent artifacts. A frat boy who turns too sharply from my stare. A cardinal capturing vision in a lilac bush on my walk home. I'm left to long even for simple th dangers. From the waist up, it's still winter. I left the world behind a long time ago. Waist down, it's catching up. A woodpecker on my window is mining grubs from some nameless tree squirrels scramble over. When I turn back, it's gone. I hadn't realized this had gone so far. Everywhere I look, it's suddenly spring. No one asked if I would like to open drastically. Look up. It's gone. Everywhere, fruits downward, I can't taste. Their branches insurmountable, my tongue burnt by frost. White boys, white flowers, and foul-mouthed jays, days made of sky-blue borders, and everything seemed much too clearly. The utterance itself was adoration, kissing stolid air. I hate every lovely thing about them. I lived in Chicago for six years and really love the city. And one of the things I like, or at least I'm really taken by about Chicago is that I think it is a city with a sort of exposed exoskeleton. Like it's, it, it's working, it's very much out in the open. It's, it's, a, it's very much still an industrial city. It's, it's all, these, all these rusted bridges. And it's sort of, um, as I said, it's almost like the, work, the guts of a machine uh, kind of spilled out. You can see the pieces of how they work or, or don't work. And um, <clears throat> Chicago has a, a really fascinating sort of lakefront. I'm, not, I'm fascinated by bodies of water in general. And uh, this Lake Michigan lakefront is especially fascinating to me because it represents a literal interpenetration of the, the human and the natural because it's man-made. Um, <clears throat> that originally most of the lakefront was either underwater or a swamp. And they sort of drained it and built a lakefront, including building several Beaches, which is sort of trucked in sand and, and built an sort of artificial slope. And there are these pylons out in the lake, and basically beyond those pylons, there's a direct drop. Because they built part of the lake, too. Um, <clears throat> and we said the, the, you know, there's a bit, you know, the sort of physical manifestation of, kind of the impress of you know, human activity, the impress 
specifically with capitalism, or Chicago is the city that works, it's, it's, it's very much a city about like, making money and working, and <clears throat> it's very much like self-image, and made a very strong impression on me. And um, <clears throat> this poem is sort of about that, about the, kind of the, the, the city as a sort of embodiment of human activity, of capitalism, and all that. I, there was another word I had, but it's, it's fled. <clears throat> This one's entitled Maritime. There's always been this dream that reason has, shared out from the conceivable, like pollen or Sahara dust. A windy day along Lake Michigan, cold water, cold war one. The fellow concrete lakefront where yuppies jog with dogs and clouds of midges hover mating is a second nature like the city it defines by exclusion. People sun themselves on yellow telecloth across cement, water too clear to be clean. The mind, unable to rest in such fragments, capital has shot up or left behind. Man-made rock fissured to exposed steel rods, absence filled in with lichen and a sudden fear of heights. The undertow of Lincoln Park, a marsh. Contradiction buried in an unstable foundation. Would be an inland gum or kite convenient to the lowest clouds. Flat roofs of residential high rises across Lakeshore Drive and lunchtime traffic. Crippled by a rising wind, untimely car. Tethered or tangled there. Would be a sign no diving, shallow water, submerged rocks. Enlightenment comes later, or not at all. Lamp posts flaring on in waterly rows in summer, when days are long and promise stalls like a guard against prevailing currents and falling barometric pressures. Every third bulb dead, burned out. Would be anywhere, almost. Over there, the real world of elevated trains and the Chicago School of Architecture rises into the sphere of possession, claims the view south. The Corbide and Corbin building, or U.S. Gypsum Tower. Market fluctuations and assorted human rights violations are duly noted in the ledger. Cement that holds society together, the concrete world of what's smashed, in order to make other things whole. That's what this afternoon America tastes of, floating tall particles and pulverized quartz on the tongue, wet sand trudged in from building sites to make a beach, closer to mud without the salt to desiccate and keep it fresh. Silicates and contained local conflicts, the debris disposed of carelessly, a rusting at breakwater, collapsed causeway green-yellow algae plashes on, a drifting Fritos bag, or this old woman asking if anyone can spare some coffee, also called the third world here at home, but not in this neighborhood. The wind employs each cardinal point in turn, or pushes a low-pressure zone across the Great Divide, of which I thought I caught a whisper, echo, or response, anchor, answer, or worse. Also, you figure. This poem is entitled The Gods at 3 a.m. And I actually started right here in a club. At, actually, it's supposed to be 3 30, but that, I, I like even when it's better. Um, <clears throat> I started writing scraps of it on them, little scraps of paper that they have at the bar for people to give each other the, the number and never call each other again. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> there, there are various sort of scraps of songs that that song were popular at the time that. <clears throat> Or actual song, basically everything that the gods say, 
is a quote from some song that they're actually playing at night. To God. So just to show you, you can get inspiration anywhere at any time. Even when you were really there for other things, it's like I'm a poem. <laughs> That's sort of one of the nice things about the, the poetry, you get a certain you know, meager compensation for the failures of one's life. Um, is there a way to, are there any other lights here? Because I'm actually having trouble seeing this. Could maybe those lights be turned on? So I'm actually having trouble seeing the, the page. Right? So. Trying to do another story. The gods at 3 a.m. The foolish gods are doing poppers while they sing along. They're taking off their white t-shirts and wiping the sweat from their foreheads with them. The gods have tattoos of skulls and roses on their shoulders. Perhaps a pink triangle above the left nipple. For them, there's hope. The gods are pausing to light cigarettes while they dance. They're laughing at private jokes while the smoke machine comes on. One of the gods told you they put talcum powder in the artificial fog, then walked away. How could anyone breathe talcum powder? But it makes their skin shine with the sweat with the sweat and smell of cigarettes and obsession. Don't try to say you didn't know the gods always white. The statues told you that. The gods don't say hello. And when you ask them how they are, the gods say they don't know. The gods are drunk and don't feel like talking now. But you can touch their muscled backs when they pass. The gods in backwards baseball caps say, free love. They say, this is the time, and disappear into another corner of the bar. They're always moving to another song. The guards with their checked flannel shirts unbuttoned and their white motorcycle jackets, under, sorry, under open motorcycle jackets, hard nipples and ghost white briefs above the waistbands of their baggy jeans, say, get here. The gods say, soon. And you just keep dancing because you don't know the words. You hope the gods will notice small devotions and smile. Maybe a quick thumbs up if you're good. The gods whose perfect instances of bodies last only for the instant or until last call. And then they disappear into the sidewalk. Gods who are splendid without meaning to be. Who do they need to impress? Say, this could be the magic. They say, live for tonight. And then the lights come on. This poem is entitled Crush and <coughs> plays on several senses of the word. Originally, it actually had an orange crush in it also. But it didn't fit, so I had to take it out. I was very, very disappointed about that. And um, that's it. I don't think there's anything else really to say about it. It also incorporates lines from popular songs. Popular music is one of, actually, yeah, probably one of the strongest influences on my poetry. And I think I originally wanted to become a poet because I wanted to be able to, to have the effect on other people that the pop songs had on me, but I didn't know music and couldn't sing. <laughs> Not that stop songs for other people, but... Kosh. <laughs> on every corner, there's a black man begging quarters, or trying to sell copies of Streetwise. Discarded newsprint squashed under pedestrians' heels. The press of people hurrying through a Friday night on Halstead Street. You don't say anything, so I don't say it. Your small hands and thin wrists driving me home. Long fingers white and smooth, expressive, almost feminine. 
almost American, the song says, and why not? Guiding the jeep through a yellow light. Movement isn't action, you begin, quoting some dead someone. I want to move. There's a bump, as if you've run over something small. Then it's my corner, and you pull up to the curb. A kiss on the forehead and out the door that sticks on the passenger side. There's an albino pigeon on my ledge. Pink eyes, darker band around the collar, no black at all. And the iridescent, and the iridescent throat, the pink legs and the lice. There's rain under sunlight, many kinds of luck. There's part of the self called reason, hailing a cab. Last night you leaned against the damp metal wall. The perspiration of a hundred men condensed there, and the salt. Looking into the middle distance of the dance floor crowded with men's moving bodies, but not for anything in particular. I watched the alternating gels on the fluorescent lights lattice your face in several colors at once. I wanted to touch you, as the soul by nature longs to touch what is beautiful. Dear Manusha, love to tell, the back of your hand across the counter when you leaned over to order a drink, vernacular grain of buckled root veneer, a puckered hair pocket, the metaphors make bodies, idle figures of speech. In Plato, the soul has wings, strange irritations at the shoulder blades, but still can be shot out of the sky by hunters who've risen before dawn for this. Packed ham sandwiches on Wonder Bread and thermoses of instant coffee, crouching for hours in plywood blinds thatched with leaves. The retriever can't track its fall, returns across the marsh, head bound, mouth empty, and his master smacks him once, then gives him a biscuit. The beautiful gives off a white light like the moment before sunup that includes but won't unfold all colors. It burns the eyes like buckshot burns the bird. Icarus with melting wings of wax and string left over from a labyrinth. Or Phaethon, scorched and fallen, all singed in, shot through with mortal light. Across the street, another black man is holding up a cardboard sign that says, Please help me, I am hungry. He doesn't look like him, and then he does. That bird, white feathers, iridescent throat, scrawls in the middle distance from my window, in the middle of the busy street, parted from its body by the yellow lane divider and parceled out into the intersection, wings smashed into dirty asphalt by passing cars and buses taking on new passengers in the golden age of winter rain. What I missed most about the city This poem is entitled Narcissus and the Namesake River, and um, <clears throat> it actually draws on, in a very unsystematic way, some concepts of, of the <clears throat> psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, like said, the name of the father, the mirror stage, and also um, I talked earlier really about the kind of tricks that I gave myself in writing poems, and one of my um, kind of assignments in this poem was to include um, all of the <clears throat> Or variation of all of this, of the, the taxonomic levels, you know, phylum, kingdom, species, genus, etc. And so they, all of them appear in some form or another in this poem. Narcissus and the namesake river. But I thought it was appropriate since he did turn into a flower. Nat, but botanical references, not assaded references should make the way to the poem. Narcissus and the namesake river. It was a lie they told about Narcissus, a libel on his name. He never loved himself, not anyone who looked like him. 
and officers didn't know his own profile. There were no mirrors in those hours, just helpless echoes. He fell for what he wanted to fall through, a man he'd never be. That desire, the long arm of the Father's law, taxing taxonomies, order and phylum, and genus and class, uprooted, upsought weeds. Words are just flowers before family names, a kingdom yet to come. Narcissus never knew his father either, never talked back or could have doubled back home. He planted himself unspecific on the bank. That woman lip-syncing without a face was no help. He couldn't help but drown in the cold, swift overflow called you. The mainstream, not a tributary. Unruly spring displacing every basin or floodplain. The other is a lack, the self-delusion and you've got to lose yourself to be found wanting. He wasn't suffering from self-delusion, just a mistake called identity. Narcissists would do anything to please. So when that voice had hidden in the current, was it running away to sea, like a sailor? Said, kiss me, I don't come around here anymore. He did. The perfect kiss, of course, was death. But who needs to fall twice? And the flower? It only wants to be picked, cut and placed in cool, still water. Um, the last poem I'm going to read from this volume is entitled Skin Trade. And um, the title is actually from a Duran Duran song. <laughs> from Notorious, a sadly underrated album. It also incorporates references to Leonard Cohen's song, Suzanne, um, to Frost Mending Wall. And I think there might be a couple others I'm remembering right now. Oh, to a song by Brian Ferry, the former team of Roxy Music, called River of Salt. And it also um, incorporates an allusion to, well, actually a quote, from <clears throat> the writing on the wall, the Daniel, which I'll from Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> many, many, techno fossils in his room, weighed and counted, weighed and found rotten, fucking all those things. And then I think is all the back story for this poem. Does anybody even remember Duran Duran anymore? <laughs> Sad. <clears throat> Skin trend. And then I said, that's what it means to testify to sit in the locked dark muttering when you should be dead to the world. The muse just shrugged and shaded his blue eyes. So naturally, I followed him down to his father's house by the river, a converted, a converted factory in the old industrial park, somewhere to sit on threadbare cushions eating my words and his promises, safe as milk that dries the throat. If I had a home, He'd be that unmade bed. He's my America, twisted in dirty sheets. My inspiration for a sleepless night. No getting around that pale skin. He throws things out the window he should keep. He collects them he should feed to the river. He takes me down. While there, I pick them up. The river always does this to me. Gulls squawking and the smell of paper mills upstream. Air crowded with effluence, like riding the bus underwater. I'm spending nights in the polluted current, teaching sunken bodies how to swim. My feet always stay wet. Sometimes I leave footprints the shape of blood. Sometimes glass flows through broken veins, and I glitter. Every other step refers to white men and their names. The spaces in between are mine. Back of the bus with you, you nigger. They're turning warehouses into condos, 
I'm selling everything at clearance prices. Here's a bronze star for something quietly like a good boy. River of salt, will I see my love again? Cold, viscous water holds its course even after it's gone. Throw a face into it and you'll never look back. Sorry. Throw a face into it and you'll never look again. Throw a voice and you'll hear sobbing all the way down. Narcissus, that's my flower, forced in January. Black eyed bells echoing sluggish eddies. Who hit him first? The muse has covered his face with his hands. It's just a reflex of the historical storm that sired him. Something to say, the sun is beating down too hard on my pith helmet. The oil slick on the river is not my fault. When are you going home? What he doesn't want to see, he doesn't see. In the sludge that drowns the river, rats pick fights with the debris. He calls them all by their first names. He's looking through his fingers like a fence. They make good neighbors. His friends make do with what they can. They drink beer from sewer-colored bottles in the dry stream bed, powdered milk of human kindness and evaporated silt. They stay by the river till past sunrise, crooning a lullaby to help it to sleep. The words of their drinking songs are scrawled on the ceiling. Mene, Mene, Deca, Ufarsin. A madrigal for the millennium's end. I'm counting down the days in someone else's unmade bed. Let these things break their hold on me. The world would like to see me dead, another gone black man. I'm still awake. I'm going to read um, a couple of poems from my most recent book, and then actually a couple of new poems. This poem is entitled Also Love You, which is the title of a song by someone I can't actually remember anymore. And it takes place on the Chicago Lakefront, because all of Chicago Lakefront is, is one big park, or Lincoln Park, that is the entire <clears throat> north south length of the city. This also includes, poem also includes references to various songs. <clears throat> and this poem is for my ex, Chris, who was not my ex at the time. These things happen. <laughs> also, love you. I think of you when I'm dead, the way rocks think of earthworms and oak roots. Tendrils that break them down to loam and nutrients. Something growing out of every disappearance. I will be simpler then, sheer molecule, much easier to understand. Steam rising from sidewalk vents. Rain accumulating on ailanthus leaves after the rain has ended. The lingering smell of rain and rotten leaves. Look for me, I'll be around. That's every song. I'll be that too. I will you kites unravel from their tangled lines. So far, you can't tell what they want to imitate. Weather balloons and evening stars, easily mistaken objects of luminosity. Observation satellites to record you just out of sight and tell you what you've missed. I will be the lichen bubbling from a crack in the Belmont rocks, where you don't go, between the brilliant men loitering in their temporary beauty. You will. I will you every artificial slab that makes a beach if you think hard enough. Anchored fronds of blue-green algae bobbing in the surface motion, just like kelp, weaving in waves on my island sand. Like, come to think of it, Siren's hair combed out to tourmaline and emerald. 
I could be this fallen branch across your path in Lincoln Park. Marker. Grasp it and push it aside. I will you people bicycling just past sunset and joggers straying from their path. Whole evenings of virus exercise. And this first of a whole series of lab posts burned out. Blocks of them. I will be the wind that messes up your hair. You've just gotten it cut. Pollen, pawn of light and light winds. Air sultry and somehow sexual. Those men still selling themselves, giving themselves up to light and passing eyes. Your eyes, perhaps. I'll be the things left behind for you. I'll be much kinder then. I'll kiss the drowsy atmosphere all the summer's afternoon. And that's not all. This poem is entitled Hermes the Trickster, and I think it was actually sort of a companion poem to the friend the poem earlier. Again, it's a poem of kind of double doppelganger, double, who's both a kind of a lover <coughs> and a sort of other you know, sort of ideal image of myself. And I actually don't like the epigraph anymore, so just pretend. For those of you who have the book, just pretend that's not there. And this also incorporates References to various songs, blah, blah, blah. Um, Hermes, the trickster. Wing born of bone, tear in my sky, storm pours through, passing through. Tear in my side, my bloodshot eye, the side heartless to, but never sinks. These dreams, damaged in transit, burn down my tenements collapsing. Unsound slum of wishes on an occasional evening storm. Venus, or unidentified object, flying blind. A common error. You've cauterized my sleep. You're part of it by now. What else do you want from me? Except to disappear. I'd like that too. You're knocking on my nightly window. Squall pressing full lips to wet pain. You're grinding against the other side of glass. They don't even leave a print. You in your black leather jacket and white briefs. You must be cold. Man at my window mouthing cold porter. Don't you know you never can win? And I said I'm not that old. Little fool asking for kisses. Careless trust. Careful, heartbeat repeating do, do, do. You soundtrack of my sleep. Breathe in, breathe out. This oxygen so pure it kills. Don't exist, I've asked of you, and you've complied. You'd like me to let you in, or let you go away. Torrents of your almost lash cracked glass night in. Night out like rain, always like winter rain in May. Avatar, sharp whip pulled from my side. I hear your friends calling you Little Wren. The last poem from this book I'm going to read is entitled World. And it's sort of, sort of meditation on something that's sort of a pretty constant thing in my work and in my life. It's a sense of, of being in possession of a uh, cultural inheritance that isn't mine. And, <clears throat> and this poem is sort of embodied by this brooch that a friend of mine for a long time ago gave me. And I'm really quite sure that he stole it from somewhere. Um, that was inscribed with the motto of the um, <clears throat> Order of the Knights of the Garter, Oniswaki Mali Pons. Um, Shame be to him who thinks evil of it. Which is my motto in many ways. And this, this thing of this, this kind of this, I guess, pretend old ill, you know, it wasn't actually mine, it wasn't even actually the person who gave it to me, um, being sort of standing in for this, this kind of cultural inheritance that's in my possession, but that isn't actually mine. You know, as, as a black man, as a gay man, as someone who grew up in housing projects, you know, 
I was not supposed to <laughs> come into possession of this. World. The man in my dream said, let me live. But that was too much of a sacrifice, and I was never just, like you. He was working for the infidel. His domino mask said that. Blue turban with one black feather and a ruby set exactly in the center. Entitled to his own sedan chair with four bearers. An unlikely forebear. Venice, perhaps. Betraying anybody's lovers to sell more of the sea. Body of cold salt water warming in the sun. An heirloom brooch my mother never owned is waiting for me when I wake up. Onisoir qui mal pense. It says in French that no one speaks anymore. Medieval as the patience it takes to go blind, counting these raised letters out of hammered gold and ivory filigree. A full year of travel and expense. Someone waited the entire 14th century for this. He's dead by now, still waiting for that final shipment from Bukhara, Samarkand, or the Turfan Basin. Shame, indeed. I should think evil of the man who could command such labor, but my ancestors weren't involved, and it was just a gift, passed down like a secret or a kiss from mouth to mouth. By the time it's come to me, it's been forgotten what it was, what that man's lips could possibly have tasted of. Who knows who he stole it from? Who knows who he is now, or where? This amulet, charm, or medallion against shames never to be named? Except by me, I must confess, not here. Never was my mother's, never belonged to anyone, I could mistake for mine. My mother had nothing she could hand down. I lost it centuries ago. In my dream, he kissed me. I forgot to say. Begged that I not think evil of him for what he had to take. Am I the same man? I was then. I won't forgive you, world I won't survive. Since I'm on the topic of history, I'm going to read a, a poem, a recent poem, entitled The Tendency of Dropped Objects to Fall. This poem was in part inspired by reading um, <coughs> Eric Hobsbawm's multi-volume history of the modern world um, from the Soviet French Revolution and Industrial Revolution um, through the 20th century, and being struck yet again by how much of, sort of human history is the history of oppression and exploitation, and of how the vast majority of people, people you know, who, who labored and died, have left no record. They, they, did they disappear as if they, as if they had never existed, and only the results of their, of their labor remain. And this poem is sort of about, in a sense, sort of, you know, as, as they say, history being written by the victor and having no place for <clears throat> those who do the actual making. Uh, the same, work exploited and die. Um, the tendency of dropped objects to fall. The air is thick with gods, crowded streets rife with them, an infestation of divinity, the serpent keeping class. What shape wants them? Memory is money. And what wind wants to do with it is scatter. Wind doesn't, want doesn't. Assembles the materials for bodies drifting through the past on rubber rafts with plastic oars they don't know how to use. Blank, wounded, or rendered otherwise helpless. Justice admires John, but never tells himself. Better to break than to be broken. 
establishing a proper format for suffering. So many laborers have elapsed, the torturable classes singing deus, singing without money we'll all die. They've all died. History leaves.